and welcome to the Frank Tashlin retrospective video. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing as it helps out the channel and give this video a like if you do like it. So this retrospective was originally uploaded with the hair remover commentary track and here with Austin Kelly, we will go over his career and we're gonna, and then afterwards we'll go through each cartoon and just give our overall uh, points of view. So grab some popcorn and let's get, get to it. So let's start off with uh, Tashlin arriving at, uh, well, actually, before he even got to Schlesinger. I mean, what, what was Tashlin doing before he got to um, Schlesinger Studios? Well, Frank Tashlin, first off, let's go back a little bit. He was born on February 19th, 1913, in the lovely state of New Jersey. In his early years, Tashlin floated around uh, to different animation studios. His usual flighty self, he was an errand boy for the Fleischer Studio. He worked at the Van Buren Studio. He did some funny stuff there. Um, in 1933, he joined the Schlesinger studio as an animator, uh, and on the side, uh, Tashlin was working on a comic strip called Van Boring, and the comic strip is uh, doing really well. People are liking it. It's making a lot of money, and by the way, uh, there's a Facebook page called Van Boring that has archived all of those strips. I highly suggest you check it out because they are very funny, and they are some wonderful poses that were definitely reused in Tashlin's 30s cartoons, like the Major Lie Till Dawn, and anytime you see a character with their big chest puffed out, that was something that Van Boring did a lot. How did he wind up at the Schlesinger Studio? I'm not exactly sure how he winded up at the Schlesinger Studio, but he would have arrived after Harmon and Ising were kicked out of the studio and went over to MGM. Uh, in mid-1933, so Tashlin would have joined a little bit after that in 1933. Now, Tashlin was doing very well with this comic strip, and Leon Schlesinger, who was, you know, obviously the producer of the cartoons, uh, was aware of how much money he was making, so Schlesinger talked to Tashlin. He wanted to cut the profits. Tashlin said no, and Schlesinger fired him. And this is the beginning of Tashlin's eternal fighting against the man. I mean, if you watch Tashlin's career and you see what he did and where he did it and why he did it and when, he's always fighting for what's right. And that's why he was always moving around to this studio and that studio because he was always fighting with people. I mean, we'll get into this more later, but he was always standing up for himself and he had very strong beliefs about what was right and what wasn't. And, you know, he wanted to stick with that. Even later on in the 50s when uh, he was working on a Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis film, uh, Jerry was not happy with Dean Martin. It was on the verge of their breakup, and Jerry was being a jerk to everyone, and Tashlin stood up to Jerry, and he said, I want you off of my set. I want you off, and I want you to get out now. So Jerry, you know, didn't yell at him, and he just left, and he didn't come back till the next day. You know, I, I just admire that about Tashlin as a human. You know, he's not afraid to stand up for what he thinks is right. Yeah, uh, for sure. So, from from what I what I watched uh, back when I was starting my uh, commentary series, I saw a lot of uh, early animation which um, has been attributed to Tashlin, and a lot of it was very very round and very reminiscent, just of the, I guess the sort of style that was going around at the time. Do, do you offhand know of any, I guess, great examples of his shots? I know he did some stuff in Buddy's Beer Garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Buddy's Beer Garden, I believe, was the only one he was credited on. Um, offhand, I'm not aware of what he would have animated at Warner Brothers. I've never actually heard of anyone uh, referencing his stuff. But um, it's interesting that you say rounded because Tashlin, obviously, later on in his life, came up with a Scott art technique. And uh, even in his Van Boring strips, which he would have been doing around the same time as, you know, animating on the Buddy cartoons, there's a lot of angular stuff and the poses aren't very rounded and, you know, characters stick out and their arms stick out. And, you know, it's very straight and angular. It, it would be interesting to see him drawing in a more rounded style uh, because it's not what he usually did. Yeah, that, uh, for, for sure. So, um... So what did he do after he got fired the uh, the first time? Uh, like, where did he head off to? Yeah, so uh, Tashlin headed off to uh, the Hal Roach studio. He did some gags on Laurel and Hardy shorts and Little Rascal shorts. Uh, and what's interesting is that he also worked at the Up Iwerks studio, uh, did some animation on the comic color cartoons and everything. Uh, offhand, I'm sad to say, I also don't know what else he would have done there or what scenes he did. Um, but it's interesting because I believe Carl Stong was also working at the Ub Iwerks studio at the time, who would obviously return uh, to the Schlesinger studio at the same time Tashlin did. And Tashlin's first cartoon, funny enough, for Warner Brothers was 
Stallings' first cartoon as well, Porky's Poultry Plant. Yeah, which uh, which is a great one. I mean, maybe not his best, but we'll definitely discuss all his cartoons in order very shortly. But um, so, what, what made him come back to the studio? I mean, you, you said to me once that he doesn't hold, he didn't hold, never hold held grudges, and he just went back to work pretty much. Well, I mean, Tashlin later in his life did hold grudges, and he was very willing to hold grudges against Bob Clampett for, you know, making up stuff in his interviews, and Chuck Jones for taking his kids' books and unfaithfully, you know, adapting them into the, you know, animated specials that Jones did. But early in his life, uh, Tashlin was uh, about 20 or 21 when he would have fought with Leon Schlesinger, and... Um, he came back a few years later after Jack King left Warner's for Disney, and Schlesinger needed someone to fill in uh, King's spot as a director, so he called Tash back, and he had Tash take over the unit. So, that was around 1936, and Tash started to direct Porky Pig cartoons there, and all of which are really funny and original, and... What set Tashlin apart from the others right off of the bat was that he took this cinematic approach to the cartoons and he was trying to make them feel like real feature films. In fact, even in later interviews, Tashlin was not afraid to admit that his mind was on making movies as opposed to cartoons when he was working on the Porkies and the Daffies at Warner's. Tashlin wasn't afraid to experiment with his cartoons, and he had quick cuts in his films along with low and high angles, perspective shots, and following the composition of a shot in a film very closely. Few of which techniques, if any, were ever done in any cartoon by any director up to that point before. Eventually, Tashlin did leave Warners again after getting up to a fight again with Henry Bender. Uh, again, this is this is why I love Tash. He wasn't afraid to fight for what he thought was right, and he didn't back down from anybody, even if it was his boss. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And his last cartoon was. Uh... At this period was your in education, which you know, which funnily enough was your first comedy with me. So it's an interesting to see that <laughs> <laughs> how much you've changed since then. So this is the part that probably interests me the most is what he did between uh, leaving Warner's the second time and and then coming back to Warner's for, for his third and final time. Um, I believe he went to Disney for a bit. That's absolutely right. Uh, after leaving Warner Brothers again, uh, Tashlin went over to the Disney Studio in early 1939. To work on their series of shorts and features and he was very excited to get there because Tashlin kind of fell into the anti-Warner mindset that Disney was king and Disney was the best and Disney was doing any, everything the best in the animation you know industry and even in later interviews when he was in his late 50s with Mike Barrier uh, Tashlin wasn't afraid to say that Disney came up with everything that was good about the animated cartoon which is frankly just wrong but i don't think he was thinking that thing that through when he was saying that kind of stuff but among the things tashlin worked on during his time at the disney studio uh he was a story man and a gag man sadly never got a screen credit which is kind of annoying because his impact was definitely left on the writing of mickey and the beanstalk which obviously would become a segment of the wonderful fun and fancy free in 1947 uh, he did storyboards for the Peter and the Wolf segment of Make Mine Music and also did some work on Disney's Lady and the Tramp movie, uh, which would have been released nearly 15 years. That's a decade and a half after Tashlin would have worked on it. After getting into a fight, as he did, with Walt Disney in March of 1941, uh, Tashlin went over to the Screen Gems cartoon studio. And, you know, people don't talk about these the studio's cartoons and there's really a good reason for that if you watch them but when Tashlin was there they did churn out some interesting stuff largely just because Tashlin was there and he did get some good people like Emery Hawkins over from Disney after they had the strike and he was able to kind of take people from the picket line as he wanted uh, the studio didn't really have the best handle on their staff and they were always swapping around management and trying to find people to work for them and this is obviously why they closed just five or six years later in the 40s because they really couldn't keep up with the competition. Uh, just a few months after joining the studio as a story man, Tashlin was put at the head of the Columbia Cartoon Studio, having to oversee production over all the stuff they were churning out, among other things. Uh, Tashlin left the Screen Gem Studio in 1942 and returned to Warner's later in that year without leaving much of an impression on the dying studio. Um, the only thing that he did that was really of any worth at the Screen Gem Studio was write 
the first cartoon with the Fox and Crow characters that the Columbia guys would use again and again for the next half a decade before they were shut down. And those characters were really the only stars that Columbia had. I mean, they attempted some stars at some other things that were largely Warner Brothers ripoffs like Flippy the Canary, but none of those took off. But uh, here's a fun fact. Chuck Jones was not afraid to admit in his later years that he was taking influence from Frank Cashlin on a lot of his work, uh, as I cover in my I Got Plenty of Mutton freeze-framing video on Anthony's channel. And Cashlin uh, really started the idea of blackout gag series of cartoons with the Fox and the Crow cartoon that he did at Columbia, so much to the point that Jones actually stole that idea for his very own series of Wile E. Coyote and Roan Rudder cartoons, you know, later on in the 1940s. Yeah, it, it, and uh, I finally got a chance to watch that one, and it was very, very interesting, and um, d- definitely worth watching as a curiosity, I, I would think, um, for sure. And now we have Tash and his return back to the studio, and it's different. <laughs> it's... You know, as you mentioned before, he had the Scott Art technique, and here it's in full display on, on, on his few shorts that he did in 1944 and 45. Mm-hmm, absolutely. I mean, that technique is beautiful and it's totally original and definitely a breath of fresh air from what other studios were doing at the time. And in a way, it was the beginning of the UPA style of, you know, modern cartooning and what dominated the industry in the 50s and the 60s. So it's interesting to see that, you know, Tashlin influenced Chuck Jones so much, who people cite as, you know, one of the greatest directors of all time. He influenced the cartoon modern style, which so many people praised. I mean, this man did so much behind the scenes that people don't talk about. I, I just find it so awful that he's so criminally underrated. Uh, and I think that's why these videos that we're doing are really doing a service, you know, discussing what he did and, you know, the things that these these staff guys, the Warner staff guys did that, you know, really influenced the world and the animation industry as a whole. But anyway, uh, Norm McKay was head of the old Bob Clampett uh, Cats unit, as they called it, because Ray Cats was you know, managing the Termite Terrace building that it was in at the Schlesinger studio. Uh, Clampett took over Tex Avery's old unit. But uh, sadly, Norm McCabe got drafted, and Tashlin had to take over for him in mid to late 1942. Now, Tashlin arrived at the studio before McCabe actually left and before he was actually fully drafted. So Schlesinger needed something to keep Tashlin busy so he wouldn't just be getting paid for nothing. So Tashlin was plopped into Clampett's unit, and he did some work on the storyboards for A Corny Concerto, hence why Tashlin received story credit on that cartoon. And in a letter to Mike Barrier uh, from Bob Clampett in the 70s, Clampett actually uh, revealed that Tashlin did a lot of you know beautiful full-color storyboards for that cartoon, which sadly, as far as I know, don't survive. Yeah, Tashlin's Warner cartoons in this period are, you know, pretty phenomenal, clearly taking influence from his peers, especially the aforementioned Clampett. Tashlin's films were jam-packed with gags to the brim, as well as keeping the fast pace and cinematic feel that his earlier shorts had, also taking influence from the Warner cartoons that were being done around the same time in terms of the comedic feel of them. In Tash's earlier work, the laughs kind of came from the reality of the story and the comedic timing and the cinematic take that Tashlin was, you know, doing with his films. Not necessarily the specific gags that were written for the cartoon. Now, while that type of comedy is still present in these films, Tashlin seemed to be focusing a lot more on comedy than he was in his earlier cartoons, like in I Got Plenty of Mutton, which is obviously going back to that Fox and Crow type of blackout gag format, and I love it. I think all of these cartoons are great, and I think, you know, they're some of the most enjoyable the Warner Studio ever turned out. Yeah, uh, exactly right. And this stint at Warner's uh, didn't last very long, which is a shame because he's made some excellent, excellent shorts in this period. But what what caused him to leave this time? I know he did went over to some sort of cl- uh, stop motion s- studio or, or am I? Mm-hmm. No, I'm that's just... right. He went at, to John Sutherland Productions. Uh, now, before we get to that, uh, what caused Tashlin to leave for the uh, third and final time was obviously his mind was only on features always and wherever he went at the Warner studio or the animation industry as a whole. And he was constantly writing scripts and trying to sell them to people. Now, in the mid-1940s, Tashlin finally sold one of those scripts to a producer that needed an idea. 
And Tashlin got paid $14,000. And he went, well, wait a minute. I could actually get some serious money in this business. So in late 1944, he left the Warner Studio for good. And he started work as a, what he thought was a step in the right direction to get into the feature industry on the Daffy Diddy series of stop motion films at John Sutherland Productions, most of which sadly don't survive. But Steve Stanchfield uh, release, recently released one of them in high definition on, uh, I believe, a stop motion Blu-ray he has. Uh, it's called The Lady Said No, and it's a very interesting film for all you Tashlin fans out there like me. But um, Tashlin got his wish finally. He started working in Hollywood. He, first off, just as a simple you know, gag writer. He did some stuff for Bob Hope and for the Marx Brothers. But soon he started to direct and he started working with Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, who were like as big as the Beatles at the time. And, you know, he did a film with Bing Crosby and he was really, uh, you know, very popular and people were really starting to appreciate his work. And obviously films are more mainstream and recognized by the public, at least at that time that cartoons were. And I think Tashman was really happy that he was finally getting some recognition and people were starting to know who he was. Uh, but sadly, all good things come to an end, and in 1972, at the very, very tragic age of ni- uh, 59, not even 60 years old, Tashlin passed away, and the whole world was never the same. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely sad, although thankfully he was interviewed um, a, a few times before he passed away. I think it was Michael Barrier, wasn't it, that uh, interviewed him? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Michael Barrier was... Uh, Did an interview with him uh, as well as a lot of other people for his wonderful Hollywood cartoons book that was literally decades in the making. I believe uh, Barrier actually did want to follow up with Tashlin like he did with Phil Monroe, who he got multiple interviews with because Phil was mentally there. And Phil worked with Jones and Freeling and all the directors and had a lot of great stuff. So Michael Barrier interviewed him a few times. Uh, But I believe uh, Barrier did want to follow up with Tashlin and do another interview. But, you know, it was just too late. It was... Tashlin had already passed, and it's a real shame because if you read that Barrier interview, I mean, Tashlin's got a lot of really good stuff to say, and what I think his mindset was at the time was just he wasn't thinking about the time he spent at the Schlesinger studio at all, and he was just saying, oh, um, this was all ripped off from Disney. He was saying everything that the Warner Studio came up with was ripped off from radio and from Disney, which is not true at all <laughs> but the interviews do bring some interesting insight uh on tashlin's career i had to suggest you check it out barrier has the transcript up on his website yeah no for, for sure and it's, it's definitely interesting to read so now we're just going to take a look at all of tashlin's directed shorts if you need more information on any of these we've taken a look at them throughout the commentary series either me solo or with austin but definitely take a look if you want more information so are you ready to take a trip down uh, memory lane there, Austin? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm always here, ready and willing and able to talk about Tashlin as much as I can. Of course. So starting off with Porky's Poultry Plant, and uh, I will say about that one first up, my goodness, comparing that to what Jack King had done previously, you know, this was a real breath of fresh air. It's not his best, but it was definitely a welcome start um, to his first directing career. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I mean, it's not his greatest cartoon, you know, just because of tiny things that were out of his control, like, you know, the inexperience of his animators. And there are some quick cuts that don't quite work out so well. But, you know, in the end, experimentation is at the core of filmmaking, and without it, all cartoons would just be lifeless Disney clones, as, you know, most of them were up to this point. But I think it's a great one for what it is. Yeah, that for sure. And um, Little Bew Porky, which I was, was joking about in the commentary track, was it, um, I always read it as Little Bow Porky, but it's apparently Bew. But anyway, that's another thing entirely. But uh, as, as, as decent as Poultry Plant was, I think Little Bew Porky is the first true Tashlin short in that you can see the, the appearance of his, all these quick cuts that work so well, the cinematic angles, and it's just an incredible short. And, um, one of the funniest things I've seen. I mean, two shorts in, and we already see the Tashlin style. Um, so that's my thoughts on, on that one. What, what do you think? 
No, oh, no, I definitely agree. I mean, I think this is a really great cartoon. It's a hit by Tashlin. I find it funny. You can really see his hatred for Porky, and he's trying to distract himself from working with the character by attempting to focus the film on his cinematography and these really interesting characters and, and villains. But in any case, it is a great cartoon all around. Definitely. And next one up is Porky in the North Woods, which um, I know uh, Mark Hausler praised it in his, in his commentary for that on the... Um, uh, Golden Collections set, and rightly so. It's a great cartoon, which, again, as you pointed out, Tashin didn't really like Porky, so he definitely focuses a bit on other characters. But once again, we get these amazing quick cuts. We get some great animation, despite, as you said before, the inexperienced animators. Um, yeah, but it, it, it's a little bit cringeworthy because of the, the bear trap and that, but, you know, I like that one. What do you think? Oh, uh, for sure. I mean, I think this one's a great one. It has some beautiful Carl Stalling music. There is some weird and weak animation in it, but like I said, that was out of Tashlin's control, right? Because the guys he had on staff, like Volney White, didn't have as much experience in the business as guys like McKimson did, who obviously wasn't working for Tashlin yet, but was an active animator at the Warner Studio. For sure. Next one up is Porky's Road Race, which... Again, it's quite clear the focus uh, for Tashin here was on, on all these uh, celebrity um, uh, caricatures, which are, are, are really, really well done, in, in my opinion. You know, Stefan Fetchett caricature aside, of course. But it's also very fast-paced and just entertaining all around. And even if you don't know who half these people are, if you want to know who some of these people are, just check my commentary. You know, shameless plug. But um, what do you think of Road Race? This is one of my personal favorites. I mean, there's just so much energy, and there's a phenomenal Carl Stalling track with In My Merry Oldsmobile and all kinds of, you know, staples that he would always use in the cartoons, and amazing caricatures by T. He. And I always found it shocking that such an amazing group of unique and complex characters would be created for a single black and white cartoon. I'm surprised that cheapskate Leon Schlesinger was okay with that kind of a thing. Ah, for sure. Maybe they worked overtime. Who knows? Um, you know, it can happen. It can happen. Um, now, Porky's Romance, um, which is actually the, the last uh, cartoon done by uh, where Porky was voiced by Joe Doherty, and the first appearance of um, the wonderful Petuna Pig, which we all love today, I guess. But I honestly am not the biggest fan of this one. However, I love the design work. And I do like some of the weirdness of it, but this one, I just thought it was a bit too mean. I don't know. There's just something about it um, personally, but I mean, you may beg to differ. I mean, what, what, how do you feel about it? Oh, I definitely beg to differ. I mean, there are some cartoons we're going to get to where I feel like Tasson put Forky through too much. Uh, we'll get to those when we come to them, but I think this is another home run. Uh, Petunia is actually a more interesting character than most of, like, the, you know, typical romantic female leads were in most of the cartoons up until this point, with the exception of, like, Olive Oil and Betty Booth the Fleischer Studio. Uh, when asked about the creation of Petunia later on, Tashlin kind of just blew it off as an afterthought, though, and he just said he needed a girl for Porky and just whipped up the character really quickly. Yeah, yeah and, and considering that it's not even consistent, where in one he's a, you know, Petunia was a girlfriend in one, and then a sister in another, and then it, it's yeah, there definitely was no consistency, and that that what well, you just said backs it up for sure, um, absolutely. So next one up is Porky's Building. I thought this was a nice little gem. I actually hadn't seen that one before. So I was watching the, uh, the Porky Pig 101 version of it. And I think now it's since then it's been restored, which is uh, even more amazing looking. And it, it's one of those those shorts where I, I don't know. I just love the ridiculousness of the idea where, okay, you two build a building and the best first one wins or something. It's like ridiculous. But you know what? Just... Just build those. Just watch the cartoon and just go with it. It's it's really funny, especially that you know. Uh, how about me, Porky? You know that little character. But what are your thoughts on Porky's building? I mean, I think this one is underrated as all heck. It's got a wonderful soundtrack, like I've been saying. It's got some great angles. Uh, it does feel like a more typical Warner cartoon, though, and it's you know well structured story. 
uh, because I feel like Tash and Cartoons before this, the story wasn't as well structured as like Warren Foster would do for First Freeling later on. Uh, the story just kind of uh, went with the flow depending on what the characters were doing. And this one also has a lot of like outright cartoony gags, which I feel like Tashlin didn't do very often. Uh, like Booby Hatched, which uh, obviously was a Tashlin 40s cartoon we'll get to later. This feels more like classic Warner fare than a classic Tashlin cartoon. But either way, the gags are pretty good and it's still a hilarious picture that deserves more recognition than it gets. Yeah, absolutely. Well, here's one that some might even argue is overplayed, but hey, you know, you can overplay this one anytime, which is uh, Porky's Railroad, which is a, which is incredible. You know, I remember watching this one heaps as a kid, and I think uh, in the colorized form too, and watching it in black and white, well, there's nothing, you know, there isn't anything better as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, and I also have a thing for trains. I do like uh, looking at the old railroads and, and and all that so i definitely got kicked out of that plus you know why would they organize a race between two trains who cares just watch it have a good time um what, what, what are your thoughts on railroad yeah i think this one is great i love this cartoon it's interesting to see Tashlin experimenting with his timing and pacing in this one. He's forcing the setup of the cartoon alone to last for nearly half of the entire length of the film. And he's also experimenting with how well he can express power and pain in a cartoon, exaggerating all of the strenuous tiny movements that Porky's train is to go through. And his experiments really pay off because you really feel that train going up that hill. And you really, you know, you're not hating the film just because it's taking so long to get over with the setup like a lot like you would with a lot of filmmakers that don't know how to time films properly i mean these experiments really paid off because this is one heck of a cartoon absolutely and the next cartoon was a bit a bit of a, a change for tashlin which is uh, speaking of the weather which is his first color cartoon and this one look if, if you know the history yes it uses a lot of repeated animation but even that aside it's a fun one, you know. It's, it's the first in his, you know, books coming to life uh, trilogy, and for what it is, it's it's pretty solid. And you know, as a as a wannabe historian, I guess I enjoyed seeing. Okay, you know, this bit came from this cartoon, this bit came from that cartoon. But entertainment wise, it's pretty solid. Um, what are your thoughts? No, I actually like this one a lot more than most people do. I mean, most people blow this one off. They call it, you know, a cheater cartoon, etc., etc. But the music is Pete Carl stalling. The backgrounds are gorgeous. And some of the choppy and weird timing in the animation by Volney White and Joe DeGallo is unintentionally hilarious. And I do like the design of the criminal and a lot of the incidental characters. So I actually do love this one. Yeah, for sure. And who doesn't like Leopold Soskowski saying, you know, speaking of the weather, da, da, da. You know, I mean, come on. That's, <laughs> it's pretty good um, as far as I'm concerned. Um, now, the let's see. What's the next one? Um, oh, well, it's uh, definitely a really good one. Hmm. Case of the Stuttering Pig, an absolute masterpiece. I mean, this one gets talked about a lot and rightly so. I mean, just... The effects animation by Ace Gamer is, of course, a big highlight in this one, especially in the beginning, setting up the mood. And, you know, then you got the villain and the, the voice work. Um, it's just incredible. It's, it's you know, by, by uh, Billy Bletcher, just, wow, absolutely amazing. Um, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, I could probably guess what you're going to say. <laughs> no, I think this is one of the best Tashlin cartoons. He's obviously poking fun of those universal horror movies, which I love. I always say that the best films with a shock or scare factor to them also have some laughs as well to lighten up the mood. And this film is the epitome of that statement. I mean, Tashlin is on fire. He's coming up with good gags, great characters. Mel Blanc's at his peak. There's amazing cinematography. And literally everything else that's great about this cartoon. I mean, the original title for it, by the way, was just called Porky's Mystery. And if they kept that, I wouldn't even dare to call this a perfect film. But in the state that it's in, I think it's reached the status of pure perfection. Absolutely. Now, my peak perfection for Tashlin, in this period at least, um, has to be Porky's Double Trouble. Now, that's, you know, it's a great idea. I mean, you know, it's a simple idea that Porky has like an evil doppelganger, you know, and, but... It just works so well, and despite being a short cartoon, this one actually feels a lot longer than what it actually is, but in a good way. Like, it doesn't overstay its welcome. It feels like a full-fledged movie 
it within a few minutes. And it's, it's, it's fu- funny as hell as well, especially that weird ending where, you know, I don't want to really spoil anything, but, you know, Petunia goes off with, uh, doesn't basically go with Porky. But what, what are your thoughts on Double Trouble? I think this one is just as amazing in its own way as Case of the Stuttering Pig. I mean, the Warner cartoons at this point are really starting to pick up in terms of quality as a whole, just because Mel Blanc is here, and, you know, voice acting is at the core of a lot of the animated films. And the villain's deceivingly nice, but terrifying high-pitched voice is great, and it's nothing like what Billy Bletcher could have done. I think the choice of casting Mel Blanc in that role is just awesome casting on Tashlin's part. I think this one's a classic. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Um, now, Tashlin's ex-color cartoon, The Woods Are Full of Cuckoos, which I saw quite a bit, actually, uh, when I was younger on Cartoon Network, which, you know, maybe I didn't enjoy as much then, but I can appreciate it now. And I guess so, a lot of the references will be lost on people today, given, um, how, you know, all the radio references and, and whatnot. Again, I point those out in my commentary track, another shameless plug. But this one's a nice one. I, I think that it's a, a funny little little gem of a cartoon to see what the uh, stars of yesterday were. So uh, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, I dare to say this isn't an amazing cartoon as much as Tash and stuff before this was. Uh, it's still pretty great, though. I mean, like with Porky's Road Race, I think it's so amazing that, you know, so many original caricatures by Teehee were done for just one single cartoon. But I do like some of the gags in here, and it is still way ahead of, like, what other studios were churning out at the time. Yeah, absolutely. And here's another um, amazing cartoon, you know, Porky at the Crocodero, which, you know, this one... Uh, as much as I love the animation and the angles and, and all that stuff and the gags too, the music, and especially in the last part, incredible. Like, you know, with Porky, you know, doing all these different uh, types of music and that. I mean, yeah, we, we get the unfortunate blackface, but it's still very, very funny. Short and it's got great music. What, what are your thoughts? I think this is another classic. It, it, Tashlin's implementing a lot of the quick cutting strategy and technique that he put in his earlier films here, and, and it's working just as well as it did there. Like you said, the second half of the cartoon has fantastic songs and music in it, and the gags are top notch. What, what I did notice with Tashlin's cartoons, starting with this one in particular, is that in a way, more so than even the Tex Avery cartoons the, from the same period, it kind of predates the popular comedy style that we see in shows like The Simpsons and Family Guy, where the jokes and gags come at like a mile, a minute, and you know they're coming right at you really fast. And it's kind of this kind of like dense and packed comedy that I think is another great Tashlin creation that he wasn't even aware of and that he should have gotten more credit for. Mm, that for sure, for sure. And uh, the next one. You know, I've noticed that some people like it, some people maybe not as much, at least compared to other Tashin's works, is uh, now that summer is gone. You know, I think this one is a, is a nice, charming little short, you know, um, you know, with a, with a bit of a moral in it, of course. Uh, I don't know, I, I, I quite enjoyed this one. What are your thoughts on now that summer is gone? Like, speaking of the weather, I like this one a lot more than most people do. The gags don't come on as heavy and plentiful as they have in the past. In fact, I think Tashlin's last few color cartoons almost feel more like Disney cartoons visually than Warner cartoons. But the animation and the backgrounds in this one are stunning, and Bob McKimson's perspective work on the squirrels are amazing. And it just makes for just an entertaining and wonderful cartoon. Absolutely, and I think it's a nice little gem. You know, not the best Tash and Short, or the best Warner Brothers Short, but I could think of worse ways of uh, passing the time. Just watch a buddy cartoon. There you go. So, um, uh, Porky the Fireman's another little gem which I hadn't seen before until I went through the Porky 101 collection for the commentary series, and my goodness, the gags really come thick and fast in this one. This one's incredible. You know, it's, it's definitely one of his most fast-paced ones. Um, what, what do you think of uh, of that one? It's the least story-oriented of all Tash and cartoons, and it's even predating the Tex Avery spot gag pictures by a few months, and it feels like a superior cartoon to most of those in a way, just because, like you said, the pacing and density of the jokes is so overwhelmingly fast and furious, which I think is great, because, you know, it just kept me laughing and laughing. I think it's a hit. Yeah, 
absolutely. And the next one, which I, every time I see the title, I, I get the, the song stuck in my head, which is, you know, have you got any castles, baby? You know, the, um, which is the second <laughs> of the um, Tashin's uh, Books Come to Life trilogy. And this one, uh, I, I actually saw quite a bit on Cartoon Network myself. But what I hadn't seen was the, the the original opening and end part where uh, I forgot what the gentleman's name is offhand, but apparently they had to cut it, cut it out once he uh, passed on, but they restored it for the DVD set, even though it was interlaced, but well, that's another thing entirely. But as for the short itself, it's a nice little short, um, and, and, and I was entertained, you know, especially with all this all the stupid dad jokes I see in these things. So um, what are your thoughts? I love this one. It combines Disney type influence in terms of the visuals, like with Now That Summer's Gone, with that amazing fast pace that I adore in these Tashlin tunes. Uh, some of the references are a bit dated and they don't hold up very well, but you have to keep in mind that uh, this was out of Tashlin's control. I mean, him along with all the other Warner guys never really thought that these cartoons would have much of a shelf life beyond a few years. So again, the faults in this cartoon and most of the others Tashlin was doing before it are not really a result of incompetence on Tashlin's part as much as it is just stuff that was out of his control. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, this one, the next one's probably my least, well, maybe second least favorite of his Porky's from this period, which is Porky's Spring Planting. And, and if anything, Porky's Romance actually has one over this one, and at least that one's memorable uh, more than this one. I thought this one was quite forgettable. It was quite clear that maybe around this point, Tashman was just not really wanting to do any Porky's anymore. It's not a bad cartoon. There are some good big things in it. But even I'm sort of struggling to remember what what happens in in the majority of it. Um, What are your thoughts? Yeah, I kind of agree. I think it's one of the few really weak and forgettable Tashlin cartoons. It feels like he's focusing too much on gags for them to really be funny, and he's forcing a lot of the comedy on the viewer. And, you know, even the ending just feels forced and a bit stupid, and it feels like the cartoon hasn't fully been resolved. It just feels like the cartoon just ends, you know? I'm not a fan of this one. Yeah, it's probably, it seems like an afterthought, but you know, that, that information's probably lost to time now, I, I would think. But the next one's an interesting one, um, not because this one's weirdly one of my more popular videos in terms of viewerships. I don't know why, but um, the Major Light Till Dawn, which I guess you don't have to know some of the radio references in this one, but it kind of helps that you, you do, especially in the beginning part. But this one's a bit uncomfortable to watch because of the stereotypes in it. But even then, I found myself laughing at some of it, but this one felt really uneven. I don't know, there's something about it. I mean, you may make the differ, of course, but I wasn't the biggest fan of this one. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I don't really beg to differ. I kind of agree with you. It feels like Tashin just trying to do typical Warner fare. And, you know, just because there's nothing outright cinematic or Tashlin-esque about this cartoon, and it feels more gag-oriented, kind of like how Porky Spring Planted felt. I do appreciate uh, the Ken Harris fight scenes and the Bob McKimson, you know, opening stuff. And uh, But beyond the animation and, and the visuals, which even then I can't really appreciate because all we have is that crappy Laserdisc print, and I wasn't too thrilled with this one. No, they're definitely right. And I think even if we get a restoration of this one, I still might be uncomfortable with it, even if I might appreciate a few new new things about it. But uh, next one, small end of an era, which is the uh, last Porky for Tashlin's first directing stint, which is Holy Smoke. And this one I had only seen for the first time in the Looney Tunes Gone Collection Volume 5 set. And... This one's interesting in terms of just the di- different little, you know, cigarette jokes um, that, that you get throughout it, uh, plus some of the effects animation and whatnot. It's not the best Porky of this period, but it was still a pretty solid one, and it also shows how inconsistent Porky is, because here he's back to being a child again, compared to a few times he's a, you know, train driver and other things. You know, Tashin simply just didn't care from what I can see. Uh, what are your thoughts on Holy Smoke? I'm surprised that people talk about this one as much as they do. I, in my opinion, I think it's a tad bit overrated. I mean, like all Tash and cartoons from the same period, there's some impressive cutting and some nice effects. And it's still a very funny and enjoyable cartoon by all means. 
but I feel more pity for Porky than anything, and I kind of feel bad for him at times, just because he didn't really deserve any of the crap that happens to him, and it kind of makes for a painfully uncomfortable cartoon, in my opinion, of course. Oh, of course. But like I said, there's still some great animation, some great cutting, so I don't outright dislike this cartoon as much as I would with some of the Terry tunes or Happy Harmonies from the same era, mm. but in any case, I'm not that much of a fan of it. Yeah, we, we all got to like that nicotine character in that one. But next cartoon, well, I know it's one of your favorites, and I guess I've got, I've got a bigger appreciation than um, at this time around uh, after watching it is, of course, Cracked Ice. And, you know, and I, I liked how, how you mentioned uh, about, about this one, about why it works so well that it starts off Disney esque and ends up kind of Avery. Um, yeah, uh, what are your thoughts on Cracked Ice? I, like you said, I mean, I think this one is phenomenal. At the beginning, it's Tashlin really trying to imitate Disney with the opening setup, and which I used to think was his way of kind of luring in the audience and then, you know, letting himself loose and letting himself do whatever he wanted. But in later interviews, he actually does respect Disney and give them a lot more credit than most people did. So I assume it's actually him trying to genuinely imitate them. But even after that setup, it, you slowly turn the plot into a twisted idea of this wealthy pig prioritizing his thirst for alcohol above the safety of others. I mean, the characters in these one shots, these Warner one shots are so rich and twisted and deep that I love it. And, of course, the wonderfully three-dimensional Bob McKimson animation in this one is top-notch. I think everything came together to create a wonderful cartoon, and it's in high def on Prime Video if you can track it down, which you should because this one is amazing. Absolutely. And, and I love the way he breaks the, the fourth wall in this one, too. It's just incredible. Um, we see these sort of gags. Um, nearing the end, uh, we have Little Punch of Vanilla, which... These days might be seen as a stereotyped cartoon, but I'm, by looking at it, it's not. I don't, I don't see it as harmful, say, some of the African stereotypes or anything. This is, well, not, you know, it's a nice little cartoon, but again, and as you mentioned before, it seems like Tashin's trying to go more Disney-esque, and this one feels like it could have been a Silly Symphonies around this time. So, um, you know, it's okay. The gags are okay. Not one of my favorites, but, uh, yeah, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I generally agree. It's not the best cartoon ever, but it's still relatively entertaining and interesting with its concept. And the reuse of some of the animation is fairly subtle, and it kind of works out pretty well. Again, there's some wonderful visuals and animation in this one, but like you said, uh, it's not the greatest. No. And uh, the next one, which is the third and final in the Books Come to Life trilogy and the last directed cartoon in Tasha's first stint, is You're in Education, which... You were with me on, which I know this uh, video is probably going to cover similar ground, but, you know, but whatever, you know, it's my channel. I'll do what I want, of course. <laughs> but this one <laughs> I really enjoy, and I saw, saw the heaps on Cartoon Network, and it was actually uncut where I was, which which is interesting. So, but I, I, the best part of this one, the part that I always remember is, of course, the stupid dad jokes involving the country names with, you know, Hungary and Fork Islands and all that you know, stupid stuff like that. Red Sea, Black Sea, Red Sea, you know, but I think it's the funniest of the three, but that's just my opinion. What, what, what do you think of uh, your education? Oh, yeah, I totally agree. I was about to say, I think it is the strongest of the three books come to life cartoons, objectively, that Tashlin did. I really love the music in this one, and I'm obviously particularly nostalgic for it because it was the first cartoon I talked about for your channel. Uh, but in any case, it isn't Tashlin's strongest, but like all of his weaker efforts, uh, which I don't think this is a weaker effort, I, I just think it's a great one, but just speaking about his weaker efforts, it's still light years funnier and visually more interesting than a lot of other cartoons that were being put out by studios in the same year. Absolutely. So, fast track a few years. So, that was 1938, which was your, edu your education, and... We then get to 1943 with the masterpiece, and I'm sure, I don't get it, it, just about no one disagrees with this. It is a masterpiece, which is Porky Pig's Feet. And in this one, we see Tashlin with a, well, it's a different style using the Scott technique. And it feels like, yeah, he just grew as an artist in those few years in between, even though, you know, he was at Disney and, you know, Screen Gems and all that. But it seemed like he grew as an artist. I mean, 
yeah. I mean, you were with me on all these commentaries for the, for all these videos, of course, so this might be a <laughs> bit of a repeat, but just your brief thoughts on Porky Pig's feet. Yeah, I think this one is a great cartoon. The combined powers of Tashlin as the director and Tashlin as a gag writer came together to create this amazing cartoon. And the one weak factor, like we were saying, of Tashlin's 30 cartoons tended to be the inexperience of his artists and animators. And the animators on this set of cartoons from the 40s blows the 30 ones out of the water. And the skill and sense for comedy that guys like Art Davis had only further helped the Tashlin cartoons become some of the funniest and most unique in history. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel the same, you know, Scrap Happy Daffy. I mean, the energy in that cartoon, yes, you know, it's a dated film in terms of the fact that it is a war-related one, but... That's not this cartoon's fault. It just, even even with the war references in mind, it is one hilarious cartoon, and it's got a, a goat as a villain. I mean, what else can you say? <laughs> you know, um, uh, brief thoughts on Scrap Happy Daffy? Oh, yeah, I think this one's another classic. The newfound Carl Stalling enthusiasm after getting the rights to the Raymond Scott music is really evident here, although there's no Scott music in this one. And you can tell how much fun he had scoring it, and the animation and layouts are top-notch as well. Tashlin's at his directing peak with some of the angles and shot sizes in this one that he incorporates in his work, and I think it's a great cartoon. Absolutely, and even Puss and Booty, which is the last of 1943, which is also the last black and white Looney Tunes cartoon, just overall, period. Um, and this one, I think it's more noteworthy, especially in the last part, with, with, the, with the wonderful uh, night scenes, and you can see all the, the wonderful lighting and the cinematic-ness, if that's even a word, um, of, of that scene. I mean, uh, brief thoughts on Puss and Booty. Yeah, I think this is a really fun one. Obviously very influential on the Tweety and Sylvester series of cartoons. And it really took advantage of being in black and white more than any other Warner cartoon did. I mean, dare I say, this is one of the most comedically dramatic films ever made. And it's such a weird combination that actually I think works out really well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now, we're getting into the first color short of his uh, second directing stint, which is um, you know, I Got Plenty of Mutton, which is an absolute classic this one, um, no doubt, would have influenced uh, the uh, Ralph and Sheepdog type shorts. Um, it's wow! It's just incredible, um, especially with, with the use of the uh, Scott Art technique. Um, your thoughts? Yeah, I think this one is one of Tashlin's best. Obviously, like you said, a major influence on Chuck Jones, as I cover in my Magic of Freeze Framing video on the cartoon. Really a funny and powerful film, and it's even getting emotional at times with the dramatic, stalling violin music that's all over the beginning of the film with the sad life of the coyote or the wolf, uh, which is really tough to do on a Warner cartoon, you know, because those are all about comedy. So I really have to give Tashlin props for that alone. Oh, absolutely. And then we got Suna Kruna, which um, is probably one of the more well-known ones in Looney Tunes history, particularly with the, the powerhouse in the beginning and, uh, you know, the, and the sing-off that we have. And even if you don't know who these uh, singers are today, I mean, we know them, but it's still a funny cartoon, I think. Maybe not his best, but it's still a very solid um, effort. Your thoughts? I mean, I think this one is a tad bit overrated, in my opinion, of course. It doesn't feel as fully Tashlin as a lot of his other films do. I mean, maybe that just had to do with the supposed involvement of Bob Clampett on this cartoon, who was supposed to collaborate with Tashlin on a stop-motion sequence for the egg-laying sequence, but either way, I'm not a big fan of this one. Sure. Um, the next one is very much lesser known, which is Brother Brat, because and no doubt that'll be due to the fact that he does have um, a bit of war references to it, although it's my understanding that it was shown without the war stuff um, uh, at certain times it was shown. But this one, well, first of all, it's in Venera. It's the final uh, Porky short that uh, Tashlin ever did. He gives Porky pants as well, which is pretty interesting. But I also love just the brilliant idea. It's like, okay, men are off to war. Women are now working to pick up the slack um, back home. But who's watching the kids? Because women were expected to, you know, look after the kids then. Um, and I thought it was an amazing idea. Execution, interesting. I, I didn't care for the, the baby book part. But aside from that, I thought it was good. Um, your thoughts? 
uh, yeah, I don't think this one is the best either. Like in Wooly, Holy Smoke, I feel a bit bad for Porky as I did earlier on just because, you know, I don't think he deserved all the stuff the baby put him through. Uh, but the animation by Art Davis is stellar as it always is. And the opening montage is a classic Tashlin setup, so I do have to give him props for that. Mm. Absolutely, but the next one is a certified classic, even though, yeah, it's war-related, but at least it's subtle enough, for the most part anyway, that you can sort of get um, get around that, uh, which is Plain Daffy, and I think Plain Daffy is just one, not only one of the best Tashin shorts, but it's one of the best Daffy shorts just full stop. Like, it is incredible, and it's got one of the, you know, the sexiest femme fatales you'll ever, you'll ever see in the cartoon world, that's for sure. Um, what are your thoughts on it? Oh, I definitely agree. This one is a stone-cold classic, not only because it's all about Daffy having a sexual desire, which he usually never had, so this is crazy, but also because it's a perfect combination of Tashlin's cinematic ways and the classic Warner cartoon humor that guys like Bob Clampett were popularizing at the time. I mean, you also gotta love the sophistication Tashlin puts on the sex jokes he in here, like with Daffy being turned on by like the Hatamari's leg. Um, now the next one is Booby Hatched. Not really too much to say about that one. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a nice charming little cartoon, but again, it may not, it's not exactly the, the funniest out there. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I kind of agree. I wasn't too amazed at it. There's some interesting shots and angles, but I'd argue it's the weakest of the Tashlin cartoons, just because it feels way too much like a typical Predator Prey Warner cartoon than it does a wannabe feature film like most of Tashlin's cartoons do. Uh, as with all of Tashlin's 40 films, though, the animation is stellar, and the visuals and backgrounds are stunning, so I can't complain, but all I'm saying is that this cartoon didn't shock me and wow me as much as plain Daffy did. Sure. And then the next one, we, we, which I think is pretty awesome, despite the fact that the ending appears to be lost the, to time, it just ends abruptly as it is at the moment, is uh, The Stupid Cupid. And first of all, it's got one of the funniest uses of Alma ever. I mean, that's as far as I'm concerned. But it has some of the greatest uh, uh, animation I've ever seen, especially when Daffy interacts with Alma and shows off his extended family and all this rubbish but you know, it's an amazing cartoon one of the funniest uh, what are your thoughts I mean it's not as outright cinematic as most of Tashlin's films are but that doesn't matter here because every single gag is amazingly funny in its own unique way obviously Art Davis is at his peak here as well focusing only on key poses and funny faces to get the most out of a simple scene of animation further proving that less is more but I think this one is a classic absolutely and the next one is a little bit of a shame actually the unruly hair because this one wow you know I'm, I'm laughing so much and just seeing how how tashin does a bugs bunny short it's just simply amazing and it's a shame he only did two i mean arguably maybe even one and a half because we'll which will go when we get to hair removal we'll say why uh but unruly hair is just a, a bona fide classic and i'm glad to see it finally restored as well and you, so you can admire it even more in all its beauty um what are your thoughts yeah, I think this is another great one. Tashlin was probably very excited to work with Bugs Bunny for the first time after doing so many Porky Pig cartoons, and it really shows because his unbridled enthusiasm is all over this hilariously classic short. Art Davis is doing, you know, as well as he always is, but this scene of Bugs tugging out his ass being one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Exactly. And that was actually the last short that he was credited on, because um, the rest he was uncredited and he, he either almost completed or barely completed the, the, these last few, but we'll discuss them anyway. We've got Behind the Meatball, which, you know, for a one-shot cartoon, it's, it's pretty solid in, in my view with, with some hilarious animation um, of the dog just thinking he found a piece of meat, but he clearly you know, didn't. And just it's, just, it's just an incredible cartoon. What are your thoughts? 
Yeah, I think this one is an overlooked masterpiece, in my opinion. Like with Cracked Ice, the characters in this seemingly boring one-shot are so rich and deep that you can't help but love it, and the dense d density with the jokes and the fast pacing that most of Tashlin's best cartoons have had up to this point is as present as it ever was here. And I also have to say that the Art Davis animation is might be my favorite stuff of his, especially the Let Me Explain gag in the last shot in the film. I think it's all hilarious. For sure. Tale of Two Mice is another one, a little gem that I, I guess a lot of people haven't seen, maybe because at the moment it's pretty much only available on Laserdisc. But, you know, it, it, it's, again, a nice little little gem involving, you know, um, uh, Abbott and Costello mice for, for some reason, because, I mean, before there were cats in a different short, but anyway, whatever, you know, we don't go for logic in these things. But, um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts Tale of Two Mice. Yeah, I think this one is a great cartoon. Like Stupid Cupid, it's not outright cinematic or Tassel-esque, but that doesn't matter because all of the gags hit just as well as they could, making for some great laughs. And, you know, as I've been saying, the MVP of the Tassel unit, Art Davis, is doing top-notch work here. And that opening scene with, you know, the mouse running over the other mouse is just as good as animation could ever get. Absolutely. And Nasty Quacks, which is... Uh, his last short with uh, Daffy, but what a way to go out with the character. It's just an incredibly funny short, and it's, you know, it's a simple idea of, you know, buying a cute little duck, and of course, as we as we know with all the animals, puppies, kittens, whatever, they're all going to grow up, and I'll just like how it grows up to be, you know, Daffy, <laughs> and an obnoxious character that the father just absolutely hates. It's, it's great setup. And if you're worried about there not being any, any sex appeal, well, there is some at the end with, you know, very funny gag. I love Nasty Quacks. It's one of his best. No, I definitely agree. I think this is a classic. The idea of Daffy being prevented from getting hurt for his own stupidity because of the relationship between a father and his daughter is hilarious, and I'm surprised that it wasn't used more or ripped off more than it was. In the end, Daffy's blind stupidity and yearn for sex screws himself over, and he's his own worst enemy. Theoretically, Daffy's as deep as he ever could be in this cartoon, and it's touches like that that I love about Tashin's cartoons more than anyone else's. Absolutely. And, and of course, we um, were up to hair remove. It was a, pretty much a patchwork. This one was probably the least complete out of all of them. But um, and it's okay. I personally didn't think much of it. it Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, clearly there was a lot that was not finished by this cartoon, uh, and obviously McKimson might have not made the best decisions here, maybe not by choice, I don't know. But he didn't, didn't just direct these for Warner Brothers, though. He did direct, direct a few uh, Snafu cartoons, uh, Gold Brick, Homefront, Chowhound, and, and Censored. Um, just overall, because I haven't actually seen those yet, I'm going to do them in a separate video, but... What are your thoughts on his uh, his snafu shorts? I mean, the snafus is just as great as the other Warner cartoons he was doing. Obviously, Art Davis and Carl Stalling and all the key people that helped make his regular cartoons great are still present there. And although the Chowhound was animated with uh, the set of Freeling guys like Virgil Ross and Jerry Chinicky, uh, but the point still stands. I mean, they're great cartoons for what they are. Absolutely, and you know those are in the public domain, so anyone can easily find them too, which is good, or, or buy the beautiful Thunder Bean set where they're all being restored. But, yeah, so we're at the end of an era, so McKimson takes over the unit, and we'll see the wonderful Daffy Doodles, which um, I do have my hands on the brand new restoration of that, so that's going to be a wonderful commentary for you guys to take a look at, even, even if just to admire... Uh, that restoration but it's also one one hell of a funny cartoon um so austin any final thoughts on tashlin as we wrap this one up i mean my general and final thoughts on tashlin are obvious i think he was a genius i think he was a very funny guy and i think that his cartoons are some of the best to ever come out of the warner studio his style was one that was at the corner of the Warner Cartoon Studio, and without it, I don't think the WB cartoons would have been as funny and great as they are overall. And for that alone, I have to thank Frank for all the wonderful work he's done throughout his career and the impact that he's left on my own life and my own personal work. Absolutely, because with me, my final thoughts on Tashlin are simply that I... Growing up, all you hear is Freeling, all you hear is Jones, all you hear is Clampett. 
but you don't really hear Tashlin. So when I was going through the Golden Collection DVD set as it was coming out in the mid-2000s, it was interesting how... It's like, Tashlin? Who, who's Tashlin? Like, I thought I knew all the Looney Tunes uh, directors. You know, who's this Tashlin fella? And sure enough, watching his film, like, wow. Boy, have I been missing out on, on a lot. And, you know, some of the cartoons I probably appreciated more rewatching as an adult, but they were never bad. Even his worst cartoons or least favorite ones, like Holy Smoke and that, were still, there's at least something about him. And I, I, I think it's incredible. And, you know, one of my missions now is to rewatch some of these cartoons again because I just love them so much. But more importantly, I want to check out more of his live action stuff. And, um, yeah. And one day I'll give my opinions on those. So, um, so Austin, uh, one question that people are going to be asking you is, are you still going to stick around the channel now that the Tashlin period's over? (laughs) Well, of course I'll still be around. You'll be getting freeze framing videos two times a week from me, and I'll be on the regular commentaries. Though I do have to say... Uh, we're going to get up to a point in the commentary series where we're going to run out of cartoons with lavishly full animation like we do now, and it's not really going to be worth freeze-framing, and, you know, Anthony and I have been throwing around some ideas as to what I can do when we get to that point, which would probably be late 50s, early 60s, it, or no later than the Seven Arts era, of course, and the Patty Freeling era of Warner Cartoons. But I did have a concept for a blog and a YouTube series called The World's Greatest Yo-Yo, which would have been talking about Tashlin's cartoons in depth chronologically one by one with a live commentary followed by a discussion, Um, which never got off the ground. But, you know, if if people would be interested in that sort of a thing, I would definitely be willing to resurrect that for, uh, you know, as a replacement for the freeze-framing series later on when we get to cartoons that aren't so freeze-frame worthy. Of course. So you're suggesting Go Go Amigo and See You Later Gladiator? Those ones are not freeze frame worthy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, when we get to those, we'll uh, it'll be interesting. But I already know how I'm going to, going to approach those. But in any case, guys, let, let us know in the comments below what's your favorite Tashlin, your least favorite Tashlin, whether um, Austin should um, pursue that series or not, and would you watch it? Um, and any other general thoughts so um, thanks for watching this uh, nice long video and until next time take care see ya